thank you for joining us for Walden School of Psychology Forensic Psychology webinar series. This session is titled Etiology and Psychobehavioral Analysis of Stranger and Domestic Stalking. At this point, I would like to turn the microphone over to our presenter. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here. And I realized you know, I do a three day seminar uh, on stalking and I'm gonna do it all in one hour so <laughs> tonight. So um, we will probably do some in-depth things in some areas and some things we won't have as much time for, but I want to give you some insights. I've, um, for those who are attending, I'm not sure what you do, if you're all students or faculty or, um, but uh, I'm a criminal psychologist by trade. I've been uh, in the field for uh, a long time. <laughs> whatever that means these days, a long time. And uh, first of all, I want you to know that I truly love my career and really enjoy um, teaching and doing research and publishing and, and uh, consulting work. I do a lot of consulting work. I work on defense cases, prosecution cases, work a lot of civil cases. Um, and I do a lot of training for law enforcement. I, I work for the uh, US military. And I do some consulting work for them and training CID. Um, I travel around the country and do some trains for them. And um, so I really have a, a, for me, I have a great career. I really love what I do. I mean, it's not for everybody, but for what I do, I certainly enjoy doing it. And uh, I, along the way, I've, I've met some interesting people. I've met a lot of offenders. I've interviewed a lot of serial killers and rapists and child molesters and pedophiles. And, and I've also interviewed a lot of victims throughout the years. And, and along the way, you're going to uh, come close to the edge sometimes in uh, working with offenders and victims and dealing with victim offender relationships. So we're going to be uh, kind of talking about some things. I have some cases I'm going to share with you tonight, cases I've been involved with, um, some personal things that have happened in my life, in my career. And I, I, I think hopefully you'll find it of interest. Please ask questions um, and we will proceed. And some will have to keep time because I have a tendency to just never to shut up. So please keep Keep track of me as I go. Um, so introduction. So that's, that's who I am. I, I work with Dr. Kristen Beyer, my my program director, and she is, is a fabulous person to work with uh, in our in our program. Uh, we have some wonderful faculty, truly wonderful faculty in our program. And uh, she took me under her wing years ago when I was out there wandering the streets. So uh, quite the opposite, Dr. Hickey. <laughs> quite the opposite. <laughs> And thank you so much for your, your presentation this evening. I know students and faculty are looking forward to it, so we're thrilled to have you. you. And I will help you with time and chat as well. So I'm, I'm here. Well, I, I do appreciate that because I, sure. you know me, I have a tendency to kind of wander. <clears throat> so, lots to cover. Yeah, lots to cover. So, just quickly, um, in our field, uh, specifically, uh, I work sex crimes and homicides and um, violent crimes, psychopathology, um, arson cases sometimes. and um, I have a huge arson case right now, and it's a, it's a civil case, but it's an arson case as well. So uh, what we do, we, we do a lot of profiling. I, I don't call myself a profiler. I mean, when I go to court, I never say I'm a criminal profiler. I, I do a lot of that, but I don't call myself that because it's, it's too Hollywood. It's not professional enough. Um, but you talk about typologies. And, but what we do um, in uh, investigative analysis is that we, we do, we look at crime scenes, we interview criminals, we, we do um, criminal profiling, we do victim profiling, um, we do victim offender relationships, do psychological profiling, um, geographic profiling, equivocal death analysis, which is equivocal death analysis is, you know, was it a suicide, was it a homicide, was it an accident, there's no, there's no skin marks. So we do that kind of work and, uh, as well. And of course, the one I've been involved with a lot has been criminal paraphilia. Um, and that's been a really dark, dark area to get into, but the one that's really necessary, uh, as we'll see as we go along uh, tonight uh, in this presentation. So forensics used to just to be just junk, you know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and then it became junk science. And then over the years, it became science. And more and more we see, we have, a, we have our own field now. We have the professional journals, we have professional meetings we attend, um, and we have incredible field of work that's been growing and growing for the past 25 years. Um, and there's opportunities for so many opportunities for students who have an interest in, in the dark side. Now, 
uh, when I say the dark side, I work that side, but there are many people within forensic psychology who don't necessarily work dark side, they, but they're still in the field. Uh, for example, threat assessment is a great field to be in, a specific area of, of investigation, threat assessment and risk uh, analysis, risk management. And we'll touch on that a little bit tonight as well. So uh, again, this is a, a exciting field to be in, many opportunities for people who are motivated and have um, an interest in, in this. I always tell students, and the best things you can do in this, I, I was doing a, a book analysis, a book review recently for somebody who wants to publish in this field. And, and I, my comment to her was, so it's, it's great to be an academic, that's wonderful. And I've been one all my career. Um, but it's also important to have an application for your academics. So you go in the field and you join organizations and you learn how to network and you network with law enforcement, uh, you network with other, other professionals in your field. And that's how you get known and you publish. Uh, and besides publishing, you go out in the field, you do some consulting work um, and you never turn down opportunities. So it's a very dynamic field. It's not one that is not a sedentary type of life. <laughs> We're always on the go and no two days are alike. Um, and I, it's a truly a great career. And some of our, some of our faculty here are, are licensed professionals and they do the clinical piece of this. And there's other of us like myself, I'm not licensed. I don't do that kind of work. I do behavioral assessments. And uh, I never tell, I always tell the courts. So I'm not, I don't do therapy. Uh, I'm, I'm an analyst and that's what I do. So it works out well. So these are some of the areas within, uh, we, investigative analysis that we focus on. Um, and let's see if we can get this thing to, oh, there we go. So we use psychological and criminological principles um, in solving crimes. My job is not to solve crimes. That, that's not what we do. Um, my job is to help law enforcement solve the crimes. Uh, they get the, the credit and I get the paycheck. I like that, that works out really well. But we are to be a different set of eyes for them. I worked on the Unibomb Task Force for the, three, the last three years before he was caught. And this is probably before a lot of you were around, but um, it was way back, but uh, to help them see things differently because they were in a, in a rut. It was, a third, it was the third um, task force they had put together and, and they're kind of spinning the wheels. And so they brought in one or two outside people like myself to, uh, to help them out. And it was a wonderful experience to see how a task force really does work on the inside. We do behavioral analysis. Uh, offender behavior, victim behavior. We help classify criminals. Uh, we train law enforcement how to interview suspects. You know, are they psychopaths? Are they sociopaths? And you know, if, what are they? Now, how would you know how to approach them? Because criminals do vary in their levels of psychopathology. We help. We help direct investigation. We don't. We don't direct them. We help and direct them. We help give ideas. Um, and when we do psychological autopsies, we kind of rebuild it afterward. What, where where this come from? We unpack the case to see some of the facts and things that happened. And we also map criminal behavior. Uh, mapping as geographic profiling is really important. Uh, one of my colleagues actually who started um, geographic profiling, Kim Rossmo, I think he's at the Texas State University now. Um, he, uh, he was involved with a case where there were three rapes. And because we, the, the, the types of victims have, he had, the offender had selected, he, he was able to predict mathematically on a computer, which you've got profiling, um, and we knew about, he knew about the victim offender relationships. He was able, able to predict not only the area of the city that the offender would be living, but he actually predicted the street and the street number of the offender, and he was correct. Now, that's science. Now, we, we certainly uh, can do that in all the cases, but, but you can see where science is coming in more and more. And so mapping is, is really important. And then of course, threat assessment, doing threat assessments, people often forget about the risk management piece of it. You know, if there's a, a peeping Tom in the area, you have a, a threat and how do you manage that threat? And, and that's important as well. So all of these are important areas that we delve into uh, in our careers in forensic psychology. Um, so we will just proceed from there. So these are some of the books I've done. Do not plan on buying them, well, unless you want to if you do, get the one in the middle. But I'm drawing my comments tonight from these books. If you do want to make a nice, because it's, it's Christmas coming up, 
the book of necrophilia is a great Christmas present. If you don't like somebody, this is the book to give them. They'll never speak to you again. <laughs> but the, but the, uh, I'm working on a, we're about to launch or start launching a, a second edition, if you will, on the sex crimes book on, on paraphilia, criminal paraphilia. Uh, so uh, we're going to go down this pathway. So these some of the books we've done I've done over the years. Um, I, so recently there was a, a man by name Coghill in Oklahoma City uh, in September who was arrested, and he was a pastor. You know, he he was a pastor no longer. He was a youth pastor at a, at a Christian church. And interesting that a little boy. Would, would catch the school bus. Other children would catch the school bus at a certain spot. And he would always come jogging along just at the time that the children were at the school bus. And what you could say, well, it was, it was coincidental. Okay. Well, yeah, it was a coincidence. He actually would run by and then he would stop to make and look around, make sure the area was clear, there were no adults around paying attention to him. And then he would, so he selected a boy, a young boy, uh, whom he approached, I think it was eight year old child and he would approach him and he was always very nice to him but then before the boy got on the bus he would touch him sexually I mean, he would touch him and he did this a few times and the boy was really uncomfortable he wasn't sure what's going on but he knew it didn't feel right this nine-year-old boy so one day he told his dad said, dad there's some guy every time i get on the bus he's standing there and so the uh, the father went over and waited for him and sure enough he showed up again same time did the same thing and you can see where he well, he had a little accident or two trying, <laughs> the father was restraining him and he got hurt. Um, the importance of this case is to underscore how offenders uh, stalk and lure and finesse their way and no one really notices. And had that boy not said anything to his dad, this guy would have gone on for, for years. He happened, to, he happened to be a youth pastor. Um, I have a student right now doing a, a dissertation on um, it, very interesting. He's doing a dissertation on on pastors, or on youth ministers, on, on people in Christian churches. So we have a lot of research done on on the Catholic Church, on on priests, Catholic priests, but we don't have really have anything on men and women, but primarily men who sexually assault children at the churches, because we had literally have hundreds and hundreds of men throughout the United States who become youth pastors for the one purpose of getting access to kids and being alone with them. So he's doing a research on that. And it should be very interesting. He's now in writing up his, uh, his result chapter. So I'm pretty excited about that study. We're going to get, get it published. So um, an interesting case. So that said about him, about this particular Coghill, you'll see the process of how he approached this child. So he, he finessed he finessed a way to find victims, okay? And to ex access them where he wouldn't be seen necessarily. It looked pretty harmless. It's a school bus, people are getting on this, children are getting on a school bus. School bus driver is so focused on making sure that there's no cars around, people aren't gonna, so they focus, he wasn't paying attention to an adult outside. So he knew it was a safe place to sexually assault a child. Um, and, and so he was nice to the boy. He, developed a report with him. He tested him a little bit, you know, moved his hand around him a little bit each time. And each time he got a little more, a uh, little more um, sexually motivated by, by touching the boy. Um, he sought him out, specifically this one child, because offenders like certain types of victims. Victimizes them and then, of course, he then leaves immediately um, and he's able to escape. And he goes back and does, he does it again. It's a very, very typical type of offender that we see in our community. And they are everywhere. And I'm, I know I'm in the field and you think, well, I see it all the time. Trust me, there are men who stalk women in stores. They prefer to go to grocery stores or shopping in different kinds of clothing stores. And they just wait, they just wait around. And they stalk women until they're alone. And when they're not paying attention, uh, they take advantage of them. And that's a whole other story, but, but it is a stalking technique that they develop in stores. So we think about this process of in-person, and then of course there's of course, people who stalk without being actually being physically in contact as well. So my question to you, and I'm sure 
uh, the answer will be very po unfortunately positive with some of you. Have you ever been stalked? Um, stalking is not a pleasant experience. I I've been stalked um, five times officially. I, I won't count the other ones because they weren't as serious, but I've been stalked five times where um, there were some real concerns. Uh, and But I just follow my own advice <laughs> and I never responded to them. And uh, I must say that my uh, my best stalker, if I, if, friendly speaking, was um, my last one, who was a nurse. And uh, it took about a year and a half to get rid of her. But uh, she finally gave up and went somewhere else. But it's interesting. Um, once you've been stalked, you never forget about it. I mean, I, I, my stalking experience began when I worked at a state hospital for the criminally insane. And I, and I was stalked by a, a patient there. And you know, she was really mentally ill, but she did almost kill me, tried to kill me. And, and uh, bless her heart, it wasn't her fault. She was mentally ill. But she did tell me that she was going to kill me. And two years later, she almost did. So being stalked has so, so many pieces to that. Um, victims never forget. It's like being a rape victim, if you're a woman, like being a rape victim, because you never forget it. It stays with you for the rest of your life. And how do you manage those, those memories uh, or that experience? And could it happen again? And there's a lot of things emotionally that, that go with being stalked. And whether it's something that happens domestically or something that happens maybe at work uh, in, in a public forum, none of it is good. None of it's good. And nobody, everybody here has a right to privacy and to be left alone. Unfortunately, not everybody buys into that. So. Uh, we have, for example, uh, we are seeing some changes in our society. Recently, um, in the past two or three years, we've seen this, well, it's been since the late 90, 1990s, um, this group of incels, okay? And I call them extreme incels. Most uh, incels are involuntarily celibate men, generally men, involuntarily celibate. And so they uh, are angry. And in, in the old days, they were just all separate. They didn't have a way to communicate. Now they're organized on the internet. And so they get together on the internet and they think about, and they talk about uh, their loneliness. And I, I understand that and I feel very badly for them. They're not bad people, they simply are lonely. And some, but some get very angry and some have become radicalized. And so they get bumped off those websites and then they go create their own websites and they become even more radicalized. Some of them have come to believe that it's their right to rape women, to stalk women. And, and by the way, all, sexual predators are stalkers. They all learn different stalking techniques. Uh, and because I consult with the, with the US military, we're seeing different kinds of offenders coming into the military now. And one, uh, one group are these extreme incels. Uh, just this year, um, this fellow, uh, Trey Genko, was, um, hates women uh, because he, he described himself as an incel. And so he wanted to go to the military and be trained how to how to with weapons. So then his plan was to go to a university and kill thousands of people, specifically women. Um, and fortunately, he was caught before he was able to harm anybody. But we do have a problem here with incels. And I have students now working on dissertations on incels because it's a it's a new and kind of emerging area where it's gone from okay to not okay. Um, where, where people are threatening to do harm. So. As we go on, um, I, it, I first started doing research on, on, um, on stalkers many years ago, I think from my first and second experiences of being stalked. And I started interviewing victims of stalking, also stalkers themselves, to kind of get, understand who these people are and, and what their issues are. And from that, um, I, I think I probably did a survey of like 500, um, 500 victims, I think, of stalking. And, and then, and then I had a chance to interview some of some of the offenders, um, created some typologies, which I published in my book on serial murder. I, I think it's important that we see how we, we can break this down. Um, when we talk about domestic stalking, you know, there's like all the the power anger ones who are um, just really angry with the world or angry with people. Um, that's a little different type of, of offender than those who are obsessed with. Uh, with their with, with their victims, and we've and we've seen that sometimes. I see people uh, domestically who get involved with people because they're obsessed with them. Um, then, of course, then we sometimes we call nuisance stalking, where someone um, 
that you know it keeps following you, it keeps calling you, and and you don't take them too seriously because you know who they are, and so on. And and so we see different levels of dangerousness here. And I also, while I'm saying that, I want to also add, most people who are stalked are not physically harmed. Emotionally, there's a lot of harm that's done when people are stalked, but, but physically not so much. Um, there are some who have done some terrible things to their victims, but generally we see, especially within domestic, um, much more the, the terror that they want to create. Um, and we're, we're going to cover a few cases here in just, just a minute. So with stranger stalking, there's also the power of the anger offenders, obsessional offenders, nuisance offenders, um, who just do it casually from, from work. Um, but then there's also sexual predators. And I, and I break them down different from sexual sex offenders. Sexual predators are people who, who are sexually aroused by the stalking of victims. In fact, I, I've interviewed men who are sexually aroused by uh, what we call fantasy stalking, where they, where they think about stalking women and they think, think it through in their minds and, and that arouses them sexually. And then they go out and they start looking for, for the right opportunities and the right victims but to go after. Uh, sexual predators are, we have so many of them in our communities. Um, and it's amazing that, amazing how many we have out there. And then of course, the last one um, in this grouping, uh, Erano Romania, these are, these are our offenders who believe that celebrities are in love with them. You know, people on television, they see, they, for some reason, they have, have this fantasy that, that this person is in love with them. And um, so then they'll, they'll stalk celebrities. And we've had, and we've seen more, more females, not, we, there are, of course, female stalkers, but we see more of them within this grouping because of their celebrity connection. They're interested in celebrities, and, and, and there's psychologically, there are, there are differences between those individuals and, and men who stalk. Um, so we will get into some of that as we go along. I just want to give you an overview here as we go. Let's, let's take, and then I'll be happy to take questions on this. Um, these are all cases I've been involved with, uh, cases I've consulted on. This is a case, of, of course, I'm not going to give any specifics in terms of where this case is because um, I think the victims would appreciate their anonymity. This is a case of a corporate video stalker, um, a case I was involved with it for this. It was a civil case. It should have been a criminal case, but because the victims were not notified until two years later, uh, the statute of limitations had passed. Because of that case, that particular state, the state of Florida, has now has a law that when you are a victim, until you know you're a victim, then the case is still alive and you can still, um, it still could be a, a criminal case. This particular case, there was a corporation where uh, there was a, um, in fact, it was the, uh, the attorney for the corporation. And no one suspected the attorney would do anything bad because he was a nice guy. Everybody liked him. And he was part of the administration. And he would, um, he, was, he was always nice to the, to the women in the office. There were several women. He would give them money. He would give them gifts. And he was married. He had his own children. Um, he wasn't trying to be romantically involved with them. He just was a very nice person, very generous person. And everybody liked him. They didn't realize that he had placed cameras in all the bathrooms. But it gets darker. It always gets darker. Um, so the women would go in and use these bathrooms, but he wanted more. So he thought about this. He planned it out very carefully. And they said he offered a deal to, to women in, in the office. And this was a huge off corporation. He offered them um, a, an opportunity to, to lose weight. He said he would hire a personal trainer and they could all come to the, um, to the event two or three times a week uh, in the back parking lot. Uh, he would pay them, uh, pay for the, for, the, for the instructor to come and so on. And some of the women said, well, I don't have anything to wear for that. He said, no, no problem. I'll, I'll give you money. You can buy your own outfits and so on. And what a generous man he was. But he had an agenda. Because some of the women said, but, but I'm going to get all sweaty. He said, well, you can always use the bathroom in the basement. It has a shower. Of course, he had cameras there as well. And anything a woman does in a bathroom, and I mean anything, was recorded. And he did this for two years. Two years, and one day somebody was uh, um, a tech man was fix, fixing his computer and came across these these videos on on his computer, 
He turned it into the corporation, to, to the president. The president said, don't say anything. Don't say anything. We'll take care of it. Yeah, they didn't take care of it all right. They called him in and said, don't, don't do it again. Just stop. And so for the next two years, it was kept, kept quiet until they finally fired the tech guy who went to the police the next day. And next day, 50 police officers showed up and raided the, uh, the corporation. And uh, the victims had no idea. They had no idea that they were victims until they were shown the videos. And they were absolutely horrified that they were in these videos. And, and, and it was so embarrassing for them. So I had to, uh, I, I had the opportunity, unfortunately, I mean, I was involved with the case. I interviewed all the victims in the case. Uh, and it was one of the hardest cases I ever had. Um, the damage that was done to these women, as one woman said, she said, I will never use a public restroom again. Another said, I will, I, in fact, I, when I go to my own restroom, I'd look for cameras. Uh, psychologically, the damage that was done. And, and the judicial system did not take it seriously. In the beginning, they, were, they offered them a, they offered him a settlement, a very small settlement with nothing, a few hundred dollars. So it, it went into a multi-million dollar um, um, case. And, and no one truly understood the position of the victims. And that really bothered me that they didn't understand that if it had been your wife, would you want, because even women are fearful that those videos would end up on the internet somewhere. And, and you know the, the terror that they felt. So. This is a man who had a family, the offender had a family, he was married, he seemed very normal, he was a nice person, and yet behind closed doors, he was doing these very nefarious deeds. Another type of offender, uh, well, offender, I will say, no, back up. Another type of stalking is called fictitious stalking, where there really isn't stalking going on, but it is stalking in the fantasy of the victim. And uh, I have, several years ago, I did a, it was an internet interview for this company. And it was a small, I, it was just small. We didn't have YouTube then. And I left my phone number <laughs> and they publicized it uh, with, the, with the interview. And uh, every, about, about two or three times a month, I get phone calls from people who are desperate. And they call me because they need help because they're being stopped. Some of them are legitimate. There's several I've had in the past five or six years that are just fictitious. They're, they're, not, they're not really true. I, I always take the case, I, I talk to them about it, I do, a, do a, I do an analysis for them. And then I realize as I'm doing it that, you know, this is not really, it's not really happening. But why is it happening to them? Why do they think it's happening? So there is a lot of information, a lot of research needs to be done on women um, I've had a couple of men as well, but primarily women who are reporting victimization when it's not really occurring. And I've had some really, really interesting cases over the years uh, of women who, who call me for assistance. Um, so it's, it's um, again, it gets very, very complicated because I, I'm not going to say, well, look, I, in fact, I had, a, I had someone from Hollywood call me a couple of years ago and a corporate executive in Hollywood and truly believes that she's being victimized. And um, she sent me all kinds of physical evidence to show me that she's being victimized. And I, and I just couldn't take the case because I, I assured her that, that this really wasn't happening, it was happening in her mind. Um, as I looked at all, all the evidence and we spent a long time going through the case, I spent months with her. And at the end, I, I, I have to be honest with you, this is really not happening um, and here's why. And, and was, she was still determined that her case was legitimate. But I know she was, it was false victimization. And it's not that I'm being critical of them at all. I, I'm not, I would never do that. I, I, my concern is how do we work with victims, with, with people who believe they're, they're being victimized? So another area of work and research I think that we should be involved with. Um, so uh, I call it site and, and non-site stalking. So site stalking where you do it directly and, and, and then non-site is where you do it off camera where people get, get stalked. Um, one of the pieces of stalking that, that we don't hear a lot about, but it's really important is the area of fantasies. Fantasies are critical, absolutely critical to understand people's fantasies. If 
if I'm an investigator and I bring someone in, and I'm pretty sure that they're they're the offender. I want to understand what what are their fantasies, because their fantasies will help me understand where they've been and where they're going. Um, it's a really critical part of an investigation, and and often um, researchers or, or or law enforcement investigators don't get into that because sometimes they just cut the chase and get a confession. But I want to know where they've been and where they're going. And I think the fantasy is a really, really important piece of this um, because they do have very specific fantasies and fantasies do um, promote them in developing under un- unsavory relationships with people and very um, unusual, bizarre thoughts. So let's take, for example, the case of the stranger stalker and the school bus driver. And this case uh, was a very uh, tragic case um, it affected this woman who um, um, she was a, a young um, woman who had been, had been a school, school bus driver for younger kids. And uh, she started getting um, notes on her doorstep, early morning notes. And she thought it was from the, 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 um, the paper boy. So when the paper boy came by one day, I mean, you're getting these different notes. She said, I, you know, I, I want to thank you for your notes, but I, I don't think you should be, you know, doing this. And, and he said, ma'am, I'm, I'm 12 years old. I, I don't leave you notes and I don't uh, leave you gifts, which she had been starting to receive gifts from him. I, I don't, I've never done that. I don't do that. And when she realized that it wasn't the boy, then she realized that she was being stalked. So she reported to the police. One of the, one of the issues with, with the police and, and I work closely with law enforcement is that they sometimes because they carry guns, it doesn't, and if they've never been stalked, it, it, it's hard for them to conceptualize how dangerous is that when someone leaves you notes? Well, that's just, that's just the, the beginning, or that's just a, a piece of the incident. It's not just an it's, it's, it's a process they're going through. These notes continued uh, for quite some time, and she reported they laid traps, they, they tried to catch this person, and they never could. And, and they, she started getting bigger gifts. One day there was a, a, a nice fur coat waiting for her, a leather coat waiting for her. Um, and so she became so upset about this. She, she moved out, um, moved in with her parents. She was gone for a few months. Then she came back. And whoever it was came back as well. The offender came back. And one day she opened, there was a, a little box on her back doorstep. And she opened it up and it was a ring, a diamond ring. And with a note saying, we are now engaged. You will wear this ring. If you don't wear it, I will kill you and all the children on the school bus. Now, I don't know whether those who are listening, if you would want, if you would wear the ring or not, um, you know, that would be some, she report to the police, of course. Um, but she wore the ring. She just was terrified. She wore the ring. And uh, one day, um, in fact, it was one year to the day that she received the first note. A UPS person came to comes to the door, comes to her door with a package for her, and she goes to sign for it, and he he hands her this um, clipboard to sign for it, and he said, and there was just a note on there in the same handwriting as the stalker, and it said, "Happy anniversary." He was a stalker, and he did not work for UPS, but he was wearing a UPS uniform, and immediately he attacked her and tied her up. Uh, in her own home uh, against the banister, uh, stair- the staircase. Um, and he said, so he said, I, where's the ring? She had just taken it off when she got home. Where's the ring? He wanted the ring back. And a little dark humor here, but I suspect uh, he was a cheap stalker. He probably wanted to give it to somebody else. Um, and so she got the ring back and he walked over to her. Of course, she was terrified. She thought she, thought she was about to die. And he leaned over and he kissed her on the cheek. And he said, um, I just want you to know that I'm coming back for you. I will never leave you. And with that, he walked on and left her tied up there. And, uh, and she was just, of course, horrified. And she moved away. She moved, moved back in with her parents. And a, a year later, um, a year later, a dozen roses appears on her doorstep of her parents' home because he found her again. And he left a note that he says, I just want you to know that I'm still here. I'm still coming back for you. You can never escape. Now, 
you can imagine. And I spoke to her a few years later uh, and I said, so what's your relationship with men? And she said, you know, I, I will never marry. I will never, I don't trust men. I know I'll never, I will go out with them sometimes, but I'll never marry one. Um, so I carry a gun. Um, I, I don't have a, a permit, but I carry a gun because it's my life. And um, I, I said, well, you know, the truth is, I mean, from my perspective as a researcher and as an investigator type of person, I, I can tell you that this is not a person who's ever going to come back for you. What he was, he enjoyed the control over you. And he's probably had several victims since he, he uh, terrorized, terrorized you. If he was going to kill you, he would have done it a long time ago. But that's not really consoling for someone who has been victimized like that. And, and this is something that will affect her course for the rest of her life. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I keep track of time here, um, about criminal and non-criminal paraphilia, there are offenders who are, who are stalkers who engage in what we call criminal paraphilia. Now, I don't mean the paraphilia where people like latex and they like plushies and furries and so on. I'm talking about people who get into the dark side where they are sexually aroused by the suffering of victims. They like to harm children and it becomes their preference over anything else. So it's sexual arousal or sexual gratification through unusual or bizarre imagery uh, or, or acts. And there's many different types of paraphilia. Um, it's, a, it's a very dark side of understanding because when you, when you talk about stalking, you can't just take it as a, that, that's all we do. The offenders often are involved with, with paraphilia. They have other aspects of, of stalking that, that makes it very, very complicated. And, and, and paraphilia, um, about 10% of American males are engaged in paraphilia. About half of them, about 5%, are engaged in criminal paraphilia. That's a lot of people, 5% who engage in criminal paraphilia. Um, and so it, it, as an investigator, I want to understand what are their sexual fantasies? Not just their fantasy, but what are their sexual fantasies? Where are they going with this? And of course, we can look in the deep end of the dark web, in the dark, dark web, and we can see, uh, we can see there that there are pedophiles and child molesters and rapists and, and so all kinds of other sexual offenders, sexual predators who hang out in the dark end of the web, deep end of the web. Um, and I have been contacted over the years by people from the dark end of the web who um, have shared some insights and have done little clips for me of people who are predators and how they communicate with each other. And, and I've interviewed a couple of people who are who come from the from the dark side of the web and and how they think. And um, it's a very, very dark area. So as the internet is a great tool for a lot of us, it's also a great tool for offenders. And they become more and more savvy, uh, just like law enforcement does. And so it's always a battle back and forth of how do we track these people down who are planning to do, do harm. And there are, it's, it's pretty dark stuff. So as we move on here, um, some sexual predators record their sexual fantasies and or their crimes because they want to relive them. Um, they're you know, fantasy role players. Fantasies and paraphilia can link cases. So that's why I really stress to investigators when I'm training them about the importance of, of delving into their fantasies um, because it can help uh, secure, uh, certainly if you understand what the paraphilia are, it can help secure search warrants and then you know what you're looking for. So again, as, as a, from an investigator's perspective, I think, I think that uh, pursuing that area of, of investigation is really important. And I, I found that most investigators have not done that because it really didn't dawn on them that was an important piece of it, of uh, understanding people who, who are sexual predators, who are, who are into stalking, um, stalking victims. So one of my students, um, Lizzie Dumig, Dr. Dumig, uh, decided to do some research and did her dissertation on stalking. And she graduated a couple of years ago, uh, former police officer. She's now pursuing some work with the federal government. And, uh, but she was interested in stalking. She did what we call a pre-sort, um, I'm sorry, a Q-sort. Uh, it was, it was a both quantitative and qualitative study and was looking at relational paraphilic attachment, which was a theory that I developed many years ago. And 
And she, so she wanted to test that theory out by looking at men who had been convicted of stalking their victims. It was sexual stalking. All, so she looked at 500 men who had been, had been convicted and did time in prison or jail for sexual stalking. And anonymously, she was able to contact, send out letters to all 500, it was all anonymous. And there were 30 of them who responded and took, and took the survey. And so we were able to, she was able to gather some information from them about these types of offenders. Um, it was the first time that that type of study has ever been done. And uh, I thought, oh, this is great. We can do a lot more of this type of, type of research. I think Walden is a great university uh, to be able to be creative in, in doing research and, and doing things where we can be, create positive social change um, for our communities. And it's not just, uh, of course, there's all kinds of fields that we can, we can make positive social, social change in, but I wanna protect people. Um, I, I wanna help, I wanna protect children. I wanna, I wanna protect adults. And we wanna understand how to do that. And so Walden uh, is very supportive on doing these types of research. I'm sure they're <laughs> a little bit strange, but, but nonetheless, this is, this is really important research. And I really commend Dr. Dumig for her, for her work. Dr. Wayne Wallace was her chair and I stood on her committee and um, I thought she just did a, a super job on her, on her dissertation. Assessing dangerousness. How do we do that? How do you know when someone's dangerous? Um, I, I spend my time, I walk around the streets, I see people. How do you know when someone's dangerous? Um, I, I've always had sort of this inclination when I see people, I kind of get a, a feel for them. And we all kind of have our different, I suppose, gifts or inclinations to people. Uh, we look at body language and what they say and how they say it and assessing dangerousness. Um, and I, I've just always been interested in people. You know, I sit in airports and I'm always traveling and I'm assessing people, looking around and seeing, I, I, yeah. I'm, so assessing dangerousness can be very complicated. It can be very complicated. Uh, so one of the issues is foreseeability. When we talk about offenders, victims, and foreseeability, when we look at mens rea, having the knowledge of the likely consequences of foreseeing the fear or intimidation that, that behavior was likely to create. So someone, let's say you cross the street and someone follows you. Doesn't mean they're following you, but it means they're crossing the street as well. So they don't know that they're having an impact on you. I, I remember one, one night I was at another university in the Midwest. It was winter time. It was cold. And I was working on a, in fact, I think I was working on one of the editions of the, this book. And it was about two or three in the morning. And I came out of my, of my office and was, you know, was coming across the quad at the university. There's no one there except this. I saw this woman come out of a building and she was on the same path I was on. And I was walking faster than her. She was walking as fast as she could, but I was walking faster because I, I have long legs. And so I knew that she was afraid. I knew that she must think there's some strange man coming up behind her. Finally, I just yelled at her. It's okay. It's just me, Dr. Ricky. You don't have to worry. It's all right. Uh, and I could just see the sigh of relief because she thought it was someone following her. And, and this is often, men often don't understand the harm that some men can do. Men often underestimate the harm they do. I just tapped her, you broke her arm. Um, they don't realize how intimidating some men can be. And sometimes women can be toward the opposite sex, opposite gender. So. We see this, this, this idea about intimidation. Was there foreseeability? Did the person realize that they were actually, was their intent? Was there are certain components here to stalking that we need to understand. Often we make mistakes. In judgments of dangerousness, practitioners are particularly prone to have a high rate of false positives. I just knew this guy was a bad dude. Or, you know, no, no, he's a nice man. And so often we are wrong in our assessments. Because it's, it's, a, it's like, how do we figure somebody out? We have to study them, we have to look at them, uh, their behavior, how they talk, how they move, um, and then their histories and so on. It, it takes a while to figure somebody out, right? Just like, for example, figure out psychopaths. How do you know when, if someone's a psychopath? Well, it's complicated. You just can't look at someone and say, well, he's a narcissist, therefore he's a psychopath. Not at all. There's, there's things we have to pay, pay close attention to, and it takes time to, to make 
proper assessments. And along the way, we can make some real serious mistakes. Am I getting too dark in here? Here we go, that's better. Um, it's getting dark here. So stalking legislation first started in California in 1990. Every state in the nation now has stock, anti-stalking statutes. Um, and so as we look at stalking, the stalking is sometimes um, you get more time in jail than you will for domestic violence, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's what they do in some states. So of course the act, there has to be an act, it has to be shown that there is an act, there has to be intent, and of course the threat. Uh, in California, it could be a, a threat or a perceived threat of, of someone stalking me. So every state's a little bit different how they tweak this about um, the elements of stalking. And uh, so it's important that not all, again, not all states are, are going to be the same. What we do, what we can say clearly from definitions of stalking is that what we try to do is early intervention. The point of, the point of, of, of having um, every state have laws against stalking is that we can do threat assessments, we can do risk management, we can, we can help victims uh, understand self-protection, understand restraining orders, what they're all about. Um, it gets very, very complicated. I was in, um, I was in, in a courtroom, I was in a courthouse one day and there was a woman there um, and she was getting a restraining order. In fact, there was like several people in line to get restraining orders. And uh, there was one, one fellow there who had a box and with, he was with his girlfriend and he opened the box and there were two dead rats in there and they were from his ex-wife. And, and, and so he wanted to get a restraining order against her. This woman I was talking to, she was getting a restraining order against her mother because she, she feared for her life from, because of her mother. It's amazing how complicated family relationships can be. So the, the courts have been reticent over the years. They, they try to help, they often don't understand. I did a training for some judges one time and many of the judges just didn't grasp the significance of being a victim of stalking until you've been one. Once you experienced it, it changes, it changes everything. Um, I, I've been pleased to see some states tightening up their, their laws um, and rules about stalking. And again, like I can say every state has, has stalking statutes. So I wanted to just mention and go back to site, site stalking for, for a couple of minutes. When we see this, this sort of pattern of behavior, the following, now it could be following on the internet, it could be following in real time. When someone's following you on the internet, it's not as serious because there's no physical contact. It could be emotionally very, very disturbing, but when there's physical following, they follow you to your home, to your place of work, that's a problem. Once there's following and then there's following at your workplace, that increases the threat level, okay? When they pay visits to your home um, and, and when they start doing vandalism, when there's signatures, signatures meaning, um, Things that they want you to see is not, it's not there to commit the crime. It's there to commit to to complete the fantasy, um, and which I'll give you an example in just a minute. Uh, and and finally, once you see signatures at a crime at, at a stalking scene, the next step often is is are, are assaults that, that can actually occur. And so you see this progression. And when someone like myself comes in and gets involved in a case, we, we want to find out where are you in this process. What, and what have you done to protect yourself? What are you doing? Who knows about this? And is an attorney involved? Uh, do you know the offender? Or, or possibly you might know who it is. Um, is it a stranger? And, and so we do this whole case analysis. But site stalking, we have seen this pattern time and time again, where they go through, through, through these steps and it increases in dangerousness. Um, and I always wanna know where they're at so I can do an assessment say, okay, on a scale of zero to 10, you're about a seven. And because you are a seven, here's what you need to do. Um, and that's part of what we do with threat assessment. So let me give you a case along this line, the case of the intimate heart stalker. Um, one, of my, one, one of my students, former student of mine, and she was divorced, but her husband didn't want her dating anybody, her ex-husband. And it had been a couple of years since they'd been divorced. She had three, uh, two, two children by him. 
And so he would leave her roses and you leave her hearts. He liked hearts and we leave her Valentine's and things like that um, in, in her mailbox. And, and uh, what she could do to live her life. And he didn't like that. So uh, he started to escalate a little bit. One day she came home from work and there, uh, there was um, on her lawn, uh, someone had poured acid in the lawn in big heart shape, uh, which of course wasn't going to go away. Um, she got a restraining order against him, but he could, and he, he didn't live that far away, but then he continued to show up. And then one day she came, um, she woke up in the morning and he had poured acid on her, on her vehicle in the heart, in the heart shape on, on the, on her hood of her car, ruining her, the hood of her car. Uh, again, he had not been caught doing it, but clearly it was pointing to him. And a week later, you know, he shows up um, in the middle of the night. He takes the family pet, kills the pet, takes the heart out of the pet, and puts the heart on the front doorstep. So you can see the escalation. The escalation was, well, when's it going to stop? And so um, she called the police and he was warned not to go back. A week later, he shows up. He drives his truck onto her lawn. He gets out of the truck. She called 911. The children are screaming in terror. He's on the front lawn, takes off his shirt, takes out a knife and carves a large heart shape in his chest with blood everywhere, okay? And of course he was arrested. Now that woman, uh, eventually there was some resolution. He went, to, he went to prison, it was resolved. She ended up marrying, she married um, a firefighter. And a couple of years later, um, the mother of the firefighter won the, won the, won the lottery. And uh, I must say this because this is really interesting. She won the, won the lottery. Well, they, they suddenly became wealthy, wealthy people. And she dropped out of school and off they went. And they, I never saw her again for 10 years. And then one day she comes to my door and she came back and she's all dressed up and she's a very wealthy woman. She said, I come back. I want to, I just wanted to come back. I want to finish my degree, but um, I just want to drop by and say hello and tell you thank you for your help. And, and I, so I, I asked her, so, you know, I'm teaching a class here this afternoon. We'd like to come by and just talk about your, your experience with your, because it's been a few years now. Uh, and, and I said, so you're, are you, how are you handling it? She's why well, I go to a therapist. Um, I go to a therapist every week. And uh, I never go, I never go anywhere alone. I still think he's going to come back for me. And I, and I remember, but she said, but I want to, I want to do this. And so she came to my class and I, she, she had a chance to get up in front of the class of 200 people. And she's talking about her experience. And someone in the class asked her, how does this make you feel? How do you feel? And that was a trigger for her. All of a sudden, all those emotions just came out. And she just broke down and cried in front of everybody because she was so horrified that he might still be out there, even though it'd been several years. And I say this because I want you to understand how devastating uh, stalking can be to victims. Yeah. Triangulation. I have a faculty member at another university. She must stalk for 25 years. You think, well, how serious is that? Very serious. The man was mentally ill. He was a professor at another university. And he stalked her. Um, and then when he couldn't reach her, he started stalking her parents uh, in North Carolina. And she was living in California. Um, and it could be very dangerous when they start to do triangulation, when they go after somebody else that you know or care for. And that's really, really important to understand. Stalking is not just one-on-one. -on -one. It can be involve other people, other groups of people. Triangulation. Threats are not clear indicators of intent or future behavior. Threats may be cathartic. Now, being cathartic doesn't mean that once they have vented themselves, like some, like President Trump, President um, Biden, um, President Obama, all the presidents of the United States, they get letters, uh, they get threatening letters, okay? And the Secret Service gets involved, they investigate, they investigate all of them. We often say, well, they, they're just being, these men or these people writing these letters, they're just being cathartic. Okay, yes, but we will know from research that it's not truly catharsis. 
because afterward they still have the anger. And so it's a telltale sign when, when they leave notes um, that they may come back for more. Um, they may use a proxy victim, often they do. So again, when investigators say, well, they're, they've, they've expressed their anger towards you, now they're done. Well, no, probably not, unfortunately. Um, so we look at offender assessment, we assess the victims, we look at the potential harm to others, the liabilities. I had a, a dentist who contacted me and said, Dr. Ricky, um, my, one of my employees uh, comes to work, she's having trouble at home and he's threatening to kill her. And we're the employees, they talk about it all the time at work and she's very concerned. And I, I think I'm just gonna fire her. I said, well, first of all, you can't fire her. <laughs> if you fire her, you're gonna get sued and you're gonna lose. Um, what you can do is you can send her home with two weeks pay, that's what I would do. And have her get, you know, resolve her issues, go with a therapist, call the police, whatever she needs to do. But you have to, you have, this, you have to do this because if you don't, you're gonna lose your other employees. They're gonna, they're gonna get off a lot of sick, sick leave and you're gonna have people quitting. So, and you're, you're gonna get sued by them as well. So you need to act upon this, but you don't wanna punish the victim here, but you wanna create other victims as well. So. And that's what he did. He sent her home for a couple of weeks and she was able to uh, get other people involved and, and bring some relief to the other employees. Um, liability is important. Law enforcement gets involved in what they know and what they are able to do. Law enforcement can't be there all the time. They're, they're the good guys, but, but they can't be there all the time. Uh, you must also be very proactive. Uh, sanctions that, that can occur, um, sexual harassment, um, and tear us off. Uh, with tear us off meaning someone comes to me, if, if, if I'm a licensed therapist, I'm not, but if I was, someone comes to me and says, you know, I've, I've harmed a lot of people, but I'm not gonna harm anybody else. I, I, don't have, I have no obligation and nor can I report that. But if I come to you and say, you know, I've killed a few people and I'm gonna kill some more people, specifically I'm gonna kill people at the office. I have no choice as a therapist, I have to report it as Tarasov. Um, and, and so that sometimes is, gets a little confusing for some therapists who don't truly grasp that, especially when they get someone in their office who is very psychopathic. Uh, stalking and technology, cyber stalking. So many ways that people can now be somebody else on the internet, whether it's texting or email, uh, video, spyware, now, there's so many ways that they can stalk people. And they can, I, I, we have a case where the uh, parents wake up in the middle of the night and they hear this man, man's voice and they go in the baby's room and here's his voice coming through the, uh, to the baby monitor. And he had hacked into the baby monitor and he was talking to the baby and saying terrible things and then told the father to get out of the room. This, this was his child now. And technology is, is for a good, but it's also for, it also can be really misused. Um, and of course, social media. There's so many ways. I had someone just call me last week who was being stalked uh, on social media. I said, well, one of the things you can do is just don't go on social media. Just don't go and look, okay? Um, if they're saying things about you because they can't find you, they don't know who, they don't know your name, but they're saying things online about you, then don't go look at it. But she said, but I use social media all the time. I said, well, these are choices that we make. So social media is another way that people can intrude upon your life. Uh, so the, we, we look at a lot of variables when we're doing violence assessment. We look at age, gender, race, ethnicity, family histories, the attachment that people have. And we're looking at someone, what makes a stalker? We, we look at their backgrounds, uh, their socioeconomic status. We look at social supports, the access to weapons. Um, Gosh, if we had just known, you know, if, if the parents just last week had said, you know, we just bought a gun uh, and our son is actually looking for ammo on, on the internet. If they just said that, uh, the police could have been called and they could have intervened and, and stopped that massacre. But hindsight is not always 2020. Mental health concerns, um, stressors that, that people are under. All these are important factors as we do these assessments these behavioral assessments. Um, one thing that 
that I hear, often hear that when I get a restraining order. I think it's part of the process. It's always important to document everything that you know about being stalked. From the moment you realize you're being, you think you're being stalked, you, you document it. And people then want what they want to get a restraining order. Restraining orders are perfect. They, they're good to have. However, you must also understand that a TPO can, can often will escalate, not always, but often will escalate the danger. And usually that danger can last between six and months in a year. And so you have to protect yourself if you're going to get a restraining order. Because stalkers don't, domestic stalkers especially, they don't pay attention to that. They don't often care about restraining orders and they're going to break them. And because they're angry because you've got a restraining order, they can obviously often become very, very violent. So again, a restraining order should be based upon the classification of a stalker, not just because he's a stalker, but what is the classification? Is there a likelihood that because there is going to be a TPO that we, we need um, more restraints? We need to put the the, offense, the victim, victim may, may, need, may need to go into hiding. As one victim told me, she said, you know, I, Dr. Ricky, I, it's not fair that I have to go into hiding. I said, well, you have a choice. I know it's not fair, but it's survival because this person, you know, and I know will kill you if, if they find you. And so then that's what she did. She disappeared for a year and then I believe it saved her life. So again, documentation, you want to harden the target. You do documentation, you file reports. You phone, your phone adjustments, you change your routines, you get off social media, print mail services. There's many things you can do to protect yourself, uh, those who are being domestically or or even uh, stranger, stranger stalked, to protect yourself. Dr. Hickey, okay. I just want to let you know we, we have about 25 minutes left. Oh, excellent. Lots of time. Just and we have two more hours. Seven. I'll take two more hours. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, other ways I've seen over the years that the victims will uh, respond to, to stalking. They will place services under somebody else's name. They will get change their email accounts. They will install uh, security devices. As one professor told me who was, she was being stalked and, and they were building a new home. And um, I said, where are you building? She said, we're building it um, at the end of a cul-de-sac so we can see him coming. I'll never forget those words. So we can see him coming. And she'd been stopping him for several years. And still this person was pervasive in, in, their, in their lives. Self-defense, um, that's always a concern. I don't uh, necessarily advocate the use of guns or weapons. Uh, I do know that self-protection is, is important. Some people are not comfortable with guns and I, I am, and I don't advocate the use of guns uh, unless your life is being threatened. Um, I, I, I know that we're all different. I have students who would never fire a gun. Uh, even, if, even if there was an offender in their room, um, they just don't like guns and, and, or, or other kinds of weapons. Uh, I think you have to decide for yourself what you need to do um, to protect yourself. If you truly believe that you are in danger, um, you, have, you have to be proactive. So whatever you need to do. Um, Self-defense can come in different, in many different forms. Uh, cell phones, of course, uh, I, I, yeah, um, cell phones, um, I mean, the amazing technology we have now that we can use to go after each other. Uh, and of course, self, self-care, victim seeking therapy. I think anybody who's being stalked needs to be in therapy. Um, therapy will help you get through this. Uh, you won't necessarily help it end, but it'll help you understand it maybe deal with it in a more logical way rather than an emotional way. Uh, I, I had one case where the fellow, where the, the, the woman got her brothers to go pay a visit to this person whom she knew was the, was the offender. And so he, he wouldn't bother her anymore. And then it worked, but it could be dangerous doing that. But sometimes it's very effective. Going alone is not the best way to go. Just handle it by yourself. If you're not a professional, if you if you've been stalked or you're being stalked, um, it's important that you realize that um, it can be very, very complicated. I'm not saying necessarily dangerous, but you need to be able to share this information, get advice from people, because because of the technology, people can diff- have different ways to, to contact you um, and to make your life miserable. And you want to make sure that your responses are are effective and appropriate. And, and if you know who, who it is, then getting an attorney 
uh, is also very important and they can become involved. Witnesses, um, contact law enforcement, um, yeah, especially when they're on campuses, when I contact law enforcement, um, I mentioned the attorneys using weapons. Um, you know, that's very dicey. I, I'm not, again, not advocating buying guns. Um, I mean, I, I have, I've carried weapons for years, but um, I mean, I've been in some very dangerous situations in my career. So uh, I have a tendency to want to protect myself. Um, but even as a male, having been stalked, um, I can remember how nerve wracking it was knowing that somebody was hiding behind the bushes or somebody was sending me packages in the mail. Um, somebody was coming to my office late at night when I'm in there working. And uh, again, some of them have mental health issues, some don't, but you know, it, it, can be, it can be pretty nerve wracking. Um, so uh, I wanted to leave a little bit of time uh, for, for questions. I kind of whipped through this. I wasn't sure how much time I had. Um, and I'm sure that there are gonna be some questions out there or thoughts on this presentation. Excellent, Dr. Hickey. I know there there certainly were in the chat. If folks have questions, um, you know, please feel free to type them in the chat or get off mute and ask Dr. Hickey. Oh, yeah, please. I will, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll get us kicked off here with, um, I think it was Keith Brown who had asked if you had ever evaluated the Mosaic Threat Assessment Tool designed by Gavin DeBecker. So, yeah, I, <laughs> so, Gavin DeBecker and I go way, way back. Um, I have great respect for his work. Um, I, I don't know how much it's being used today. Uh, I know that when it came out, it was uh, quite popular. I, I remember, uh, I, I don't know if you know, know Gavin DeBecker. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gift of Fear, which I have recommended to students over the years uh, as an excellent book to read. It's kind of, kind of recognizing your own fears. So, he developed this mosaic where you can deal with stalkers. This goes back to Los Angeles, the LAPD back in the what, 70s, early 80s, I think it was. I, I attended a, a conference one time, uh, it was a threat assessment conference um, down in Disney, Disneyland, it was for law enforcement. And I, I got an invitation to go. So there's here, there's 600 people in the room. There are two or three professors like, like myself and then all these cops. And I just remember watching and, and one, one uh, LAPD officer who's now retired, he got up and said, you should, um, you should always have a restraining order. And then Gavin DeBerg got up and he gave his presentation, you should never, ever, never have a restraining order. And it was interesting that they took d totally different approaches. Afterward, um, a particular person who said we should always have them was, on, was there talking to Gavin DeBecker and they got into a bit of, a, of an argument. And I was standing there with them, there, there was four of us. And interesting, the Becker just took this guy apart, piece by piece. I mean, he was methodical. And I don't think De Becker even had maybe high school education, but brilliant, a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant man. Nothing but respect for him. Man. And, you know, they are, so my, my assessment of all this is uh, from that discussion that they had, Yes, you should always have a restraining order, but recognizing what that means when you get a restraining order. Um, again, going back to Mosaic, I, I don't, today I have not looked at Mosaic for many years. I have no idea whether it's being used a lot now or not. Um, but it certainly didn't make an impact when it first came out. I mean, there's always going to be critics of people's tools that they use, their assessment tools. And, uh, you know, same with the PCLR. There's always critics, but then that's the whole point of science is that we build upon those criticisms to make things better. And I just don't know what he's done in the past few years to, to do that. Anyway, that's all I can say, uh, Keith, about right. that. Okay, thank you for that. All right, there are a couple more um, questions yes. there in the chat here. There's lots of comments about the webinar as well, how folks have enjoyed it. But okay, so Rachel Strebel uh, asked, how do you think the glamorization of stalking on TV shows and movies has affected law enforcement or victim response? Well, 
I think that law, I, I think that we glamorize it and we glamorize violence as well. And so if you're going to glamorize violence, you're naturally going to be glamorizing stalking because that's always kind of inherently there somewhere. Um, I, I think that, I think that, that we do ourselves a disservice by doing that, but we can't help ourselves. You know, the, the, the media gives us what, what we want to see and we think it's kind of cool on television until you're a victim and then you realize it's not cool at all. Um, I mean, I, I believe that we should have choice that we can make. And I think we can make choices to turn our televisions off. But unfortunately, the media is going to keep cranking out these movies that um, kind of glorify that. I, I, if you, like, like the offenders, specifically the offenders. Uh, people think it's really cool to interview serial killers. And I've interviewed several in my career. Um, it's not cool. Uh, forensically speaking, it's, 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 it's what we do. It's our, it's our work. We, we do analysis of them. But we must, must never forget the damage they've done, the harm they've done. Um, it's not something glamorous. I, I had a student who became a, a therapist, ended up on death row in California, and uh, she was a bit of a groupie. And she didn't last long on death row as a groupie. She, ends up, she ended up losing her career. Now she's somewhere else in the United States, um, not, not doing what she wanted to do because she didn't understand it. This is not, this is not a, a fun thing to do. This is, this is, this is real life. And people get harmed, and I, I, I think that we have over-sexualized our society, our children. Um, don't get me started on this. <laughs> don't get me started, because I think that we are harming our society. I think we are per, our permissiveness, if you will, to make assumptions. Like, yeah, no, and I, I'm going to stop in there because otherwise, I'm going to get, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole that. Some people not know. Sure, right. Right. sure, let's not do that. All right. <laughs> My boss knows me. He knows me well. Don't get me started. <laughs> see here. A couple of additional questions. So someone did ask about your comment that you're not a clinical psychologist, but that you're a psychologist and you consult on these cases. And I thought maybe you could speak to that a bit. Yes. Um, yep. For how, you know, students interested in consulting, how would they kind of parlay their interest and their experience into that field without having to be a licensed psychologist? It's a great question. So I, in my last life, in my last career uh, move, I was a dean of a clinical forensic program. And you know, AP doesn't recognize forensics, which is to their detriment. Um, and so all my students there, all 500 of them became licensed clinical psychologists. Um, we have them, of course, in our field, Dr. Dr. Byer, my, who's just speaking here, she is a licensed clinical psychologist. She's also a forensic psychologist. So they work both. Um, I, I don't do therapy. Uh, it's, it's not my area of, of interest. Uh, I don't have the patience for it, um, so that's important. I, I don't uh, I don't do diagnostics. Um, what I do is behavioral analysis, and as an analyst, then uh, I can do assessments. I can do non-clinical assessments. I, I do often do them. Sometimes for the courts, sometimes for private agencies, and so on. I'll do an assessment, but I'm very clear that I don't do a clinical. I don't do that kind of testing part. But, but given my experience and my in my research, my publications, uh, in my career, the past 40 years, um, I'm, I've become an expert now. Let me just say this about an expert. I'm an expert because my colleagues say I'm an expert, not because I say I'm an expert. You are an expert when your colleagues say you are. Um, and so that's important. So there's lots of work for people like myself who want to do this kind of work. I Again, train law enforcement. I have... I, I train around the country, other countries I travel to, I train law enforcement. I've been in many countries and train law enforcement. Um, I do seminars um, and uh, I train psychologists. I train um, all kinds of different groups of people. Um, you, you don't have, okay, if, if I'm gonna work in a prison, I have to be licensed, but I don't work in a prison. No, I, I don't work in institutions. I'm a consultant, um, I'm a contractor, and I do, I do it privately. So. There are many people like myself who do this private work, but you, you establish yourself by publishing. You establish yourself, and there was a, someone just recently wants to publish a book, and I did, did a review of the book, and she made some comments in the book, and, I, and I'm just telling her right tomorrow, you know, you need to take those comments out. She made a comment about, well, she 
tried to contact the, the FBI, but, but they didn't return her call. Well, let me tell you about this. You have to be, you have to get out there and network. You have to become credible. You, yes, you publish, but those, make those publications work for you. So you go up work in the field. You don't insert yourself into, into investigations. You don't do that, but you make yourself available. And in a, I, I always refer to myself as sort of the, the Forrest Gump of forensics because I keep popping up everywhere. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and I know that sounds, sounds kind of odd, but I kind of am that way. And, and, I'm, and, and I've never passed up opportunities. Um, I've done a lot of TV shows. I mean, I've done over 50 documentaries now uh, with, you know, from, I don't know, History Channel, Discovery Channel, and all those channels. I've done different. And, and the reason, I, don't, I don't usually get paid for those. That's fine. It gives me um, more access. It gets me more publicity, more more exposure to the public. Uh, it gets more more cases I I, I, can, I consult on, and I really love that consulting part of it um, because I can do a lot of critical thinking. I can sit here in my office and I can work and I can uh, I can go through the case piece by piece. Like if I'm doing a civil case, um, and I do a lot of civil cases now, um, some uh, a firm or, or family will hire me. And I, I might be in year three because civil cases don't go usually go to trial. They usually will last four or five, six, seven years, and then they will settle in court, but they don't go to trial. Um, and so somewhere along that line, I'm involved and I render my opinion, my assessment, and I write a very lengthy report and so on. And so I like doing that part. I like enjoy I, I enjoy going as an expert witness in court too. I, I like being an expert witness in court. Um, and I've also learned that you never speak outside your your area of expertise. Um, so, again, if you want to be licensed and do therapy and and work on work in prison, that's fine. Or if you want to have a private practice and you want to have people come to your home and you want to do therapy for them, that's fine. Um, I, I think Dr. Barr can speak to that better than I can. I think that's an important piece of it. But you can also be licensed and, and be in forensics, of course, and and have your own private practice. Um, I, for example, I'd like to see Walden create a forensic nursing program. Make it a perhaps a an add-on, maybe a certificate program, something where nurses who, who want to go on and work with offenders uh, can do that. How to, to work in that side because it, it's not an easy type of work to do, but it's a fascinating area um, because forensics has applications in all areas in business, in psychology, in sociology, um, in education. You know, school bullying, school violence, workplace violence. Uh, I've done I've done assessments in in, in for for governments. I've done them for private, private businesses to help them get rid of people, uh, certain employees. Um, so again, there are lots of applications. You'll never, I never, I stopped doing my website many years ago because I was getting too many cases. So um, you never have to worry about work. But I'll tell you one thing: you do have to be. You have to be ethical. You have to be ethical. And and you have to be um, you're going to make a few enemies along the way. Sure, a couple of enemies. You make a lot more friends, but ethics are so important in this field. You have to come prepared, dress for success, treat people with, with respect, whether they're offenders or victims, whoever you're dealing with. Um, and do never speak outside your area of expertise, and don't be afraid to to forward up somebody else and refer cases on if you're not if you're not, not that expert to do that case. But uh, no, this it's it's a great field to be in. Yeah, you just, just a reminder that we do have um, specialty guidelines for ethics uh, specifically related to, uh, related to the field of forensic psychology, and you can check those out at APA.org. So Dr. Hickey, you know, talking about ethical guidelines, and um, obviously APA has those, but there are specific guidelines to those who practice within the forensic realm with some of the unique um, circumstances that we face, so something for students to check out. Uh, Dr. Hickey, I know we, our time, we've got a couple minutes left. I want to make sure that we're um, answering folks' questions as they're putting it in the chat. Um, let's see, Joy Macon asks, uh, or says, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hickey. I'm curious if you have found that there's a higher rate of certain mental disorders or personality disorders that tend to be more common um, in stalkers aside from those with paraphilias. Uh, yes. So if you're looking at domestic stalkers, uh, yes, you'd find um, so you have personality, uh, often personality disorders. Um, again, that's not mental illness, it's personality disorders. And the guy's a narcissist or a butthead. Uh, uh, 
I interviewed one fellow who said, he says, I'll never let them go. I, I'll always find them. And he, he, he was, spent his whole life trying to track down a woman because she left him. Um, men who cannot, cannot handle rejection um, will sometimes stalk their, stalk their victims. Um, but yes, paraphilia is, that's a different, you know, if you're sexually motivated vis-a-vis, -vis, you're just motivated because you want power and control over the victim. And sometimes that's, that's the case. Um, yeah. Anyway, I hope that helped. So yes, and so Dr. Hickey, just another comment on that for 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 uh, in relation to that. Um, certainly, delusional disorder is something that's often associated with those yes. who are stalking and kind of that um, Hollywood, you know, where, where there isn't the nexus relationship, where they have that erotomanic kind of thought that they are involved in a relationship, and it's really uh, a, a delusional. Um, structure within the individual. So, you know, like a David Letterman, I'm going old school here, but, um, you know, Madonna, all of those folks who have stalkers who they, you know, they actually think that they have some kind of relationship that tends to be more delusional yeah. disorder, correct? We've had, we've had celebrities murdered as a result of being stalked and um, they just didn't realize what was, what was coming, coming at them. Um, so that's very tragic, uh, very tragic. Um, so just you know, if if you get a sense that someone's stalking you in some way with, through the internet, just start keeping track of things. But I, I never entertain stalkers. I don't respond to them. Once once I know who they are, once once I know what they they have an agenda, then I cut them off and and we're done. Um, but I always I always watch my back as well. Yes, and so I see that we've got uh, Nova here. We've got a comment about Nova. Absolutely, Nova is a great great organization. Absolutely. Uh, if, if I can just take one moment, because there was a comment about kind of licensure again. You know, again, sure. um, our forensic psychology program here at Walden is a non-licensure track program. That only, you know, the main difference with that is if you are interested in doing direct work, like Dr. Hickey was saying, if you're doing therapy, if you're doing um, assessments, you, you need a license, any kind of, you know, so any profession that's dealing directly with individuals providing direct care requires a license and the license is they every state sets the standards for license within their state so that's not something that Walden sets that's not even something that APA sets American Psychological Association for those who are interested in consulting and in doing indirect work where you're not working with with um, clients directly if you're working as Dr. Hickey has described throughout his presentation he's working with law enforcement agencies so that is something that does not require a license. Um, it doesn't, you know, so if, you know, for students who, a lot of our students are interested in working within some kind of um, government institution, if you're working uh, within an agency like the FBI and you're not providing direct services, there's no license required, right? So that's, that's something that I just want to make sure on. And I'm going to put my name in the chat and my email if students have any questions about licensure in particular, I'm happy to. Could you put your phone number in there too as well? You put your phone number as well. I am yeah. going to put and my your home address, address and home address, what yes. time I make dinner and everyone's invited. <laughs> 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 Only kidding. Uh, um, yeah. All right, folks. So just a, anything, we do have a couple minutes. I know time is precious, so I want to make sure that we are um, answering any questions. I guess maybe just a couple of final words or thoughts from you, Dr. Hickey. I know a lot of folks are saying how they're interested in this field. I know we had a comment um, about, you know, uh, as an older student just starting my journey in forensic psychology with a focus on psychopathy, do you see any barriers in making a career of this field? Uh, absolutely not. I, I think it's about your passion. Um, I, I When I started my, my career, I had no... Um, no connections. I came from Canada. I didn't know anybody. I got to do criminal justice. And, and so what do I do next? And so it was just a matter of processing. Some of you here listening tonight are already professionals. You, you have many years of experience already. And so you can roll that all in. Um, I think it's just about being passionate. I, I mean, I'm never going to retire. Why would I retire when I love what I do? Uh, some people look for retirement. I, I would never, never do that. I, I'll drop dead someday and then that'll be the end of it and that'll be fine. Um, but doing what you love to do. And there was a, I had a student in a few, about five years ago at Walden when I first came here and, and I was talking to her and she said, Dr. I think I wasted my life. She says, I, I spent, she said, she was in general psychology. She goes, I've been a baker all my life and, and I've just baked goods and 
And now I'm in psychology and, and I've wasted all that time. I said, you didn't waste any minute. Think about this. You are the expert in baking. You can have your own network. You can have your own TV show. You can have the PhD in, in psychology and you can talk about the psychology of food and talk about eating and eating disorders and about baking and you can, you can have your own show. I mean, you could be a, a consultant. Uh, people will hire you as a consultant. I mean, she had no idea that all her life she'd been preparing for this wonderful degree in psychology, which would help her then use with her with her background. Just don't be afraid. Uh, fear is what keeps us from being moving forward. And I always say, go forward, just onward, just go forward. You can do this. Um, if I can do this, you can do this. It's a matter of self-discipline. And yes, sometimes luck, uh, but I don't believe luck too much. I believe that you make things happen. Never pass up opportunities. Um, and just, just follow, follow your dream. I, uh, many years ago, uh, I invited one of my colleagues to, to uh, write a book with me on Sermers and the Victims. And he said, no, no one's going to read that book because it's, it's, just, too, it's just too dark um, if, if you do that. And so I went and did it. He said, I said, I want to become a, want to work in this field. And so many years later, he wrote a letter of apology to the Chronicle of Higher Education. And he apologized. He said, who am I? to tell a student that he can't, she, he or she cannot realize their dreams. Dr. He's dream was to do what he, what he has become. And he's now a criminal profiler. So, um, you know, I, I apologize to him publicly and I'm never gonna do that to students again. Follow your dreams. And I, I think that's really important. Um, there's so much, I, I'm so sorry when I have an hour. I, I would like to, I, so much more I could have said and wanted to say, but I just realized we were, we were really pressed for time. Um, but I'll be at the residency next week for those who are coming and we can chat then. I can do, do advising and I'll be doing a presentation. We have wonderful faculty, by the way, we have wonderful faculty who will be there um, as well in attendance. And so, uh, so thank you. And thank you for coming, Arianna Dotson. Thank you so much. And all of you who came today, I, I hope that you will realize your dreams as I have. And, and by the way, my dreams are never complete. They're, I'm just was always doing something to do more. Um, and it's fun. It's, it's it's a lot of fun doing it. Um, yeah, you, you never get bored. But if you need some assistance in kind of figuring out your, your pathway, just give me a call. You know, be what I call, please be a happy stalker and call me. <laughs> and, how about and, email? We'll put, how about email? We'll go with email. Yeah, that's fine. yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm yeah. happy. So, so Julie Canopa just said, um, perhaps we could offer a part two or a follow-up to this presentation since there was so much interest in it. And I did put something in the chat for all of our attendees about you know, being on the lookout for additional webinars. This will conclude our webinar series for 2021, hard to believe. Um, but we, here we are in December, so this will be a, oh. the last webinar that we offer. But. Um, you know, while we're recording it, and he's on he's on recording, we'll hit him up for maybe another webinar early in uh, 2022, um, maybe continuing the discussion on this since there's so much. We could do one on becoming a on becoming a consultant, um, expert witness and consultant. We can we can do that, and we can maybe parse that up more and and get more specific on, on things to do and and how to do it. I mean. I, I, I was told I had to publish. I didn't know anything about publishing at all, but I learned and it wasn't that difficult. And now I love to publish. Speaking of publishing. <laughs> Indeed. And yes, Indeed. I shall, I shall send you an email on that as well, Dr. Hickey. Yes. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Indeed. Well, um, I, I wanted What's to give a record? big thank you. Indeed, that is on record, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so a big, a big thank you to Dr. Hickey for his time this evening. This is above and beyond his um, workload requirements for the university. He is here this evening or this afternoon, depending on your time zone, out of the genuineness of his heart and encouraging students and sharing his expertise. So um, many thanks to him for his time today. Um, also, I want to thank uh, the, our Office of Academic Affairs folks, Julie Canova yes. and Kayla as thank well. Walden. They um, help with the logistics and getting this all up and running. I know there have been lots of comments in the chat about whether this is recorded and whether students will have access to the recording. And Julie or Kayla, I, I know that it is recorded, and they do get a link to the recording. Am I correct on that? Yes, correct. watch your email. Oh. <laughs> 
Exactly. Sorry. Great. Yes. So you all will get an email with a, a link to the recorded this um, webinar this evening. So you will be in receipt of that if you obviously you registered for it. So, um, and I did put my this is Dr. Byer. I put my email in the chat. If you have um, suggestions or webinars that you'd like to see, we are pulling our webinar schedule together for 2022. Um, so please send me an email, and I'll you know we'll we'll definitely entertain. Um, some ideas that these are for you, so we want to clearly offer something that you all are interested in. So have a great See night and a happy holiday season to everyone. Take care. Yes. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.